I wish to make a statement to the House. There has been much speculation over the past week about the possibility of the Government bringing before the House a motion on Brexit for another so-called meaningful vote under the statutory framework provided in the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. On the 13th of March, however, the Right Honourable Lady, the Member for Wallasey, asked on a point of order at column 394 whether it would be proper for the Government to keep bringing the same deal back to the House ad infinitum. I replied that no ruling was necessary at that stage, but that one might be required at some point in the future. Subsequently, members on both sides of the House, and indeed on both sides of the Brexit argument, have expressed their concerns to me about the House being repeatedly asked to pronounce on the same fundamental proposition. The 24th edition of Erskine May states on page 397 that, and I quote, a motion or an amendment which is the same in substance as a question which has been decided during a session may not be brought forward again during that same session. It goes on to state that, and I quote, attempts have been made to evade this rule by raising again with verbal alterations the essential portions of motions which have been negatived. Whether the second motion is substantially the same as the first is finally a matter for the judgment of the chair. This convention is very strong and of long standing, dating back to the 2nd of April, 1604. Last Thursday, the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Rhonda, quoted examples of occasions when the ruling had been reasserted by four different speakers of this House, notably in 1864, 1870, 1882, 1891 and 1912. Each time the Speaker of the day ruled that a motion could not be brought back because it had already been decided in that same session of Parliament. Indeed, Erskine May makes reference to no fewer than 12 such rulings up to the year 1920. One of the reasons why the rule has lasted so long is that it is a necessary rule to ensure the sensible use of the House's time and the proper respect for the decisions which it takes. Decisions of the House matter. They have weight. In many cases, they have direct effects, not only here, but on the lives of our constituents. Absence of Speaker intervention since 1920 is attributable not to the discontinuation of the Convention, but to general compliance with it. Thus, as Erskine May notes, the Public Bill Office has often disallowed bills on the ground that a bill with the same or very similar long title cannot be presented again in the same session. So far as our present situation is concerned, let me summarise the chronology of events. The draft EU withdrawal agreement, giving effect to the deal between the Government and the EU, was published on the 14th of November, and the agreement itself, together with the accompanying political declaration on the future relationship 
received endorsement from the European Council on the 25th of November. The first scheduled vote on what I will hereafter refer to as the deal was due to take place on the 11th of December. However, on the 10th of December, the vote was postponed after 164 speeches had already been made over three of the five days allotted for the debate. That postponement was not caused by me, nor by the House, but by the Government. Indeed, I pointed out at the time that this was deeply discourteous to the House, and I suggested that the permission of the House for that postponement should be sought. Regrettably, it was not. Over five weeks later, following a further five-day debate, the first meaningful vote was held on the 15th of January, which the Government lost by a margin of 230 votes, the largest in parliamentary history. Subsequently, the second meaningful vote was expected to take place in February, but once again there was a postponement. It finally happened only last Tuesday, the 12th of March. The Government's motion on the deal was again very heavily defeated. In my judgment, that second meaningful vote motion did not fall foul of the Convention about matters already having been decided during the same session. This was because it could credibly be argued that it was a different proposition from that already rejected by the House on the 15th of January. It contained a number of legal changes which the Government considered to be binding and which had been agreed with the European Union after further intensive discussions. Moreover, the Government's second meaningful vote motion was accompanied by the publication of three new documents, two issued jointly with the EU and the third a unilateral declaration from the UK not objected to by it. In procedural terms, it was therefore quite proper that the debate and the second vote took place last week. The Government responded to its defeat, as it had promised to do, by scheduling debates about a New Deal Brexit and an Article 50 extension on the 13th and 14th of March, respectively. It has been strongly rumoured, though I have not received confirmation of this, that third and even possibly fourth meaningful vote motions will be attempted. Hence this statement, which is designed to signal what would be orderly and what would not. This is my conclusion. If the Government wishes to bring forward a new proposition that is neither the same nor substantially the same as that disposed of by the House on the 12th of March, this would be entirely in order. What the Government cannot legitimately do is to resubmit to the House the same proposition or substantially the same proposition as that of last week, which was rejected by 149 votes. This ruling should not be regarded as my last word on the subject. It is simply meant to indicate the test which the Government must meet in order for me to rule that a third meaningful vote can legitimately be held in this parliamentary session. 
order. Point of order. Yes, indeed. Point, uh, uh, point of order. Yes, point of order. Sir Peter Bottomley. Mr. Speaker, can I put three points following your helpful statement? The first is, at the beginning of it, you referred to may and not the word must. At the end, you used the word must and not the word may. And the second, or those are the first two points, the third point is this. When Sir Ian Gilmore put forward a provision, in effect, for putting carpets and coffee in betting offices, the uh, Puritans objected, so withdrew the bill, and shortly afterwards, a bill called Miscellaneous Premises, Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, was passed, because no one noticed it. It had to do with coffee and carpets in betting shops. There are times when the title has changed, and perhaps if the long title changed, something the government put forward might be accepted by the chair, rather than must be ruled out. Well, I'm not sure there were three points there. I detected only two. I don't wish to be unkind or discourteous to the right honourable gentleman, whom I hope I always treat with the utmost respect, but I am somewhat foxed and befuddled by his first observation, which wasn't as overpoweringly clear to me as manifestly it was to him. I certainly referred to Erskine May. I wasn't conscious that I had used the words may early in my statement and must at the end of my statement in a way which would brook of contradiction or indeed be open to the suggestion that they were contradictory. If the right honourable gentleman wishes to labour under that impression and can subsequently convince me over either a cup of coffee or a cup of tea that I have erred in some material respect, then I would say to the right honourable gentleman that I shall always be prepared to profit by his counsels. As far as the point in respect of the Lady Ian Gilmore is concerned, I am not familiar with that particular example. I suspect that it would be interesting reading and I will add it to my list in the period of days that lies ahead. And I thank him for what he said and the courtesy with which he has said it. I will come to the right honourable gentleman. I might perhaps go to the chair of the European Scrutiny Committee, Sir William Cash. Uh, Mr Speaker, it seems to me that what you've said makes an enormous amount of sense, given the fact, given the fact that actually this has been defeated on two separate occasions. And unless there is a substantial difference, it must follow that what you have said in a very important statement makes an enormous amount of sense. I just wondered one thing with regard to the precedent of 1604, whether there was any connection between that and very shortly afterwards was the gunpowder plot. <laughs> well, the Honourable Gentleman is a far superior historian. He may know. I will not say. And I appreciate also his sense of humour on what is nevertheless an extremely important occasion. But I thank him for what he has said. I have always respected the Honourable Gentleman as a principled and indefatigable parliamentarian. In fact, I think across this House, whether people agree with the Honourable Gentleman or not, they know of one thing which I once said, as he knows, on the occasion of Her Majesty the Queen's visit to this place and directly to her that the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Stone, speaks and votes only and always as he thinks the national interest requires. There can be no greater compliment to a Member of Parliament than to say that to him or her. A point of order, Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank you for your uh, statement this afternoon. We do indeed live in interesting times. However, I think it is fair to say, Mr Speaker, we are in a constitutional crisis, and I seek your advice on how we can convey a message to the Government that the issue of leadership is now most important and indeed imperative. And what can we do to unveil upon the Prime Minister that she must immediately call a meeting of all opposition leaders in order that we can react to this crisis and find a way ahead? And moreover, here, here, here. that the Prime Minister must immediately meet with the heads of government in Edinburgh and in Cardiff. Here, here, here. The gentleman has made his point with force and alacrity. Uh, it's not, I think, for me to say who the Prime Minister should or shouldn't meet. But that point is registered. It is on the record. If I know the right honourable gentleman as well as I think I do, it will be repeated by him with some passion and vociferousness in the days ahead, and not least because of the force with which it is articulated again and again and again. 
I feel certain that it will be heard. Whether it's heeded remains to be seen, but it will be heard. Yes, uh, a point of order, Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. First of all, may I say how delighted I am that you have decided to follow precedent, which is something I am greatly in favour of. And dare I say, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repented than the 99 who are not in need of repentance. But I wondered if he might help the House with the two points of clarity. The first is, would his indication today prevent the second reading, or even the first reading, of the so-called Wade Bill that may have the same effect of confirming uh, the meaningful vote? And would I be right in thinking that a new session after a prorogation would allow the motion to be re returned to the House? Well, I think that the House would decide on the principle of the wave bill at second reading if we got to that point. The point that the Honourable Gentleman makes, and the, if you'll forgive me saying so, partly rhetorical question accompanying it about post prorogation and a new session, uh, seems to me to be self evidently valid. Uh, I am not advocating that, but that point is self-evidently valid. And I thank the Honourable Gentleman for what he said. Uh, it, I will come to the Right Honourable Gentleman, because the Right Honourable Lady raised a point of order with me. Perhaps I can identify Angela Eagle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And will uh, you confirm uh, to the House today that the point of this ruling in Erskine May uh, it, it was to stop the bullying of the legislature by the executive yep. yeah. and to exclude the facts that MPs may be either being strong-armed, bullied or bribed yeah. with issues such as the sacking of the current civil servant who has been in charge of the Brexit negotiations who, by the way, actually predicted when overheard in a Brussels bar that what we've seen, meaningful vote one, two, three, four, five ad infinitum, would be their way of getting this botched deal through the House, but that the Erskine May rules are precisely to avoid the kind of spectacle that we have been witnessing in the last few months. And will he take the government's other behaviours uh, ignoring votes of Parliament, making a distinction between votes which somehow are binding and not binding, refusing to grant opposition days, beginning not to vote in opposition days and to ignore those issues that are actually passed by this House which have devalued Parliament's uh, opinion and will he uh, say uh, to the House today that he is going to take account of all of this behaviour as he judges meaningful vote three and any motion which the government may bring forward. I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Lady for her point of order. I will reflect very carefully on what she said to me. She is an extremely experienced and seasoned parliamentarian and, of course, a former shadow leader of the House. So I will factor into my thinking the considerations that she has adduced. I don't think that there is one single rationale for the emergence and continuation of the Convention. I touched upon some of the thinking behind it in my statement. I think it would be true to say that a concern with the judicious use of parliamentary time when that time is finite and the avoidance of its wastage is an important factor. Another important factor, colleagues, is ensuring clarity and consistency so far as the statute book is concerned. Associated with underlying all of that, I think there is a concept of respect for the importance of decisions made by the House and wait to be attached to them. So I will reflect very carefully on these matters, and I very gently say to the Honourable Gentleman Member for North East Somerset, because I failed to respond to that point, and it was a, a very good and wittily delivered one, so far as tradition is concerned, uh, he has a perfectly fair point. A tradition does matter. It is important. What I would say to him is, just because it isn't desirable to follow precedent in every case, irrespective of circumstance, 
doesn't mean that it is justified not to follow it. It depends on the particular circumstance. It depends, for example, whether one is facilitating the House and allowing the expression of an opinion which might otherwise be denied, as was the case on the 9th of January. In this case, of course, where we are talking about the same question rule, I have already explained that this matter has been treated of by the House, and therefore the question of whether a subsequent motion is the same or substantially the same is a live matter for consideration and judgment at the appropriate time. In fact, that seems to me to be so obviously commonsensical an observation that only an extraordinarily sophisticated person, perhaps bereft of such common sense, could fail to grasp it. And the honourable gentleman most certainly wouldn't fall into that con category because he is both extraordinarily sophisticated and blessed, I feel sure, with a very large supply of common sense. Um, point of order, Mark Francois. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, you have said memorably in the past that sometimes we have to take the rough with the smooth. Well, it seems to me today that that applies to others. Can I ask if this principle applies in other contexts as well? So, for instance, the House voted a few weeks ago on what became known as the Cooper Bowles Amendment to overturn Standing Order 14.1, essentially to take control of the order paper for a day. Th that was rejected. Last week, the House then voted against what became the Benn Amendment, but which was, I would argue, substantially similar to the original Cooper Bowles Amendment, to take control of the order paper and override Standing Order 14.1. Now, you on that occasion, sir, judged that it was permissible to ask this question because it was not exactly the same as the first one. But could I offer you a thought that if there were to be a third variant of that, if it were to be substantially the same, then to be consistent, sir, you would have to rule that out too. Well, I'm always grateful to the right honourable gentleman. I've often reminded the House, and I say for the benefit of those attending to our proceedings that I first came to know the Right Honourable Gentleman in September 1983 when I unkindly and wrongly suggested that he was intellectually knee-high to a grasshopper. That was very unfair of me and to the great credit of the Right Honourable Gentleman he didn't appear to bear any grudge and we've got on pretty well over the ensuing 35 and a half years. I always listen to his advice. The answer is Everything depends upon context and circumstance. Oh, yes, of course it does. Manifestly and incontrovertibly it does. It isn't a question of abstract principle or wallowing, as Edmund Burke would say, in the realms of metaphysical abstraction, but attending to circumstance. And I would look at that with the important considerations and principle of which he's reminded me in the forefront of my mind in making a judgment. He's absolutely entitled to raise that point, and I would indeed have to weigh very carefully whether a proposition was in fact the same or substantially the same, or whether it could credibly be contended that it was different. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I will come to the right honourable gentleman. Point of order, Anna Subri. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this is what happens when you don't seek consensus and compromise from the beginning, but you lay down red lines and you doggedly stick to them with an act of stubbornness and brinkmanship that has brought us to this point. Mr Speaker, this has to be unprecedented, uh, the crisis that's now upon the country. We're due to leave the European Union in 11 days and there is no plan, there is no certainty, and this country is crying out for it, especially business. Mr Speaker, what would you 
now expect the government to do? Because we're relying on tweets and rumour and spin from number 10. And as I say, the clock is ticking. Uh, there's no, no disrespect to those that sit on the Treasury bench, but there is no senior member here from government who can help us with a timetable. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker. I, I said a senior member who can help us with a timetable. Yeah, like and now we have that senior member with a timetable. No disrespect to my honourable friend who, uh, for Hastings and Rye. So, Mr Speaker, what would you now expect so that we can have a timetable so we can make the progress to do the right thing now by the country in this crisis? What I say to the right honourable lady is threefold. First of all, there was already present in the chamber before the arrival of the Leader of the House, whom we welcome to our proceedings, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, who by any standard must be considered to be senior. I'm not going to get into a vulgar argument about the respective levels of seniority of different honourable and right honourable members, and there are different forms of seniority, of course, but the right honourable lady for Hastings and Rye was already present and the leader has now joined us. What I would say to the right honourable lady is that I don't think it's for me to say what the government should do, but what I would say is that I think it would be helpful to the House to have the earliest possible indication of how the government intends to proceed in this important matter. Of course, we may learn more about the government's intentions as a result of the upcoming urgent question which I have granted to the Right Honourable Lady, the member for Putney. And that question was applied for to me this morning, and I have granted it, and I have every expectation that the Right Honourable Lady and many others will be in their places. So we will learn more anon. And as far as colleagues' dispositions are concerned, in other words, what they choose to do, how they wish to proceed, that, of course, is a matter for them. The role of the Speaker is to seek to facilitate the House, and, if I may say so, and I will, to have a particular regard for the concerns of backbench members who should be heard in this place. Part of the responsibility of the Speaker is, frankly, to speak truth to power. I have always done that, and no matter what, I always will, because I think that is the proper thing to do. Others can proceed as they wish, but I have never been pushed around, and I'm not going to start now. Uh, point of order, Vicky Ford. And as a new newish member of this house, thank you for the clarity of that statement and for also confirming that everything depends on context and circumstance. Because since the vote last Tuesday, this House has obviously voted against a second referendum, against the Cooper Bowles Amendment twice, and against a no deal Brexit in eleven days' time. Are those the sort of decisions that in your view affect the context and circumstances in which this House might make its own decision. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think the context is a freestanding matter. I think it depends on the situation at the time, and that is partly a matter of opinion, because all government, all influence of human beings upon another ultimately rests upon opinion. And I think it depends what the situation is more widely. So I know that the Honourable Lady wouldn't seek to entice me, because that would be unkind of her, and she wouldn't do that, to pronounce on other questions which are not today before the House. I wouldn't do that, but I would reflect on them in the circumstances of the time, and it's perfectly reasonable that I should be asked to do so if that situation arises. I, I do apologise to the Chair of the Brexit Select Committee, whom I should have called several minutes ago. Point of order, Mr Hilary Benn. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, uh, very grateful. Mr Speaker, in distinguishing between the character of the first meaningful vote and the second, in your statement you drew attention to the fact that in the second meaningful vote the Government had brought back to the House additional documents and assurances and legal agreements that had not been <coughs> contained within the first. Does your statement suggest in any way that in order for 
a third meaningful vote to not fall within the uh, statement that you've just made, that it would require further changes to be agreed with the European Union rather than, for example, the government saying, well, it's prepared to make an offer to, say, a particular party represented in this chamber about its participation in future arrangements. In other words, would there have to be new political agreement under Section 13.1 of the European Union Withdrawal Act in order for such a motion to be in order as opposed to not in order? What I would say to the right honourable gentleman, whom I thank for his point of order, and preliminarily off the top of my head, is that in all likelihood the answer to his question is yes. I do think a demonstrable change to the proposition would be required. For example, simply a change in an opinion about something wouldn't itself constitute a change in the offer. And so I would have to look at the particulars, I'd have to make an honest assessment of the circumstances and perhaps of the competing claims made as to the veracity of one proposition or argument or another. But fundamentally, for something to be different, it has to be, by definition, fundamentally different. Not different in terms of wording, but difference in terms of substance. And this is in the context of a negotiation with others outside the United Kingdom. So that would be my initial feeling. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, of course. Uh, I will come to the Honourable Gentleman. Point of order, Neil O'Brien. Mr Speaker, and I don't envy you in trying to make these difficult decisions. First, I wondered if I could press you on your no, no, understanding no, no, no. of substantively different. Um, for example, were the government to come back with a proposition uh, that they would write into law the Stormont lock? Would that be substantively different? If there were to be commentary that changed our opinion of this at the European Council, would that be substantially different? I know that many members of this House already feel that having taken no deal off the table, something I voted against, already makes the situation substantially different, Mr Speaker. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. And secondly, Mr Speaker, you listed some precedents, starting with 1604. It's very uh, interesting to the new members. Some members were here already. Uh, I, I was not as a new member. Um, uh, um, uh, of course, we are in an unprecedented situation, Mr Speaker, in which we have voted for a referendum given sovereignty to those who it belongs to the people, and we are now bound by that decision. And I would simply say to you, Mr Speaker, how will you uh, deal with this unprecedented situation? Because my constituents who are worried about their jobs or worried about losing the Brexit they voted for will always prefer you, instead of rigidly uh, uh, sticking with um, precedents from 1604, to be a modern speaker for modern times who can not stand in the way of delivering the deal, the only deal I believe will solve this problem. Demonstrated with the very greatest of respect to the honourable gentleman over a period of nine and a half years and more, that I am not a stickler for tradition. I do not believe in doing everything the same way forevermore just because, as so many people have said to me, oh, Mr Speaker, it's always been done that way, or oh, we've never previously had X. I've been ready to countenance change. I remember once being told many years ago by a retired and senior clerk of this House that she was very pleased that I had secured support for the establishment of a nursery in the House, which members and staff could pay for. She just wanted to say to me she didn't know whether I was aware that throughout her four decades service in the House, the idea of such an established facility had periodically been discussed, but unfortunately nothing had ever happened. And that was not helpful for her in terms of work-life balance, her professional commitments and her childcare responsibilities. So I think I can say with the very greatest of respect that I have attempted to be a progressive change-maker. So far as the particulars are concerned, it depends on the circumstances. It has to depend on the circumstances. I would have to look at the specifics. It would be reckless and foolhardy to pronounce in abstract. What I further would say to the Honourable Gentleman, just to remind him of the context of my statement, is that as far as the use of time is concerned, we have been addressing this matter for a period spanning four months. 
insofar as time has been lost during that period, for example, at one point, a loss of five weeks, five weeks without the matter coming to the House, that wasn't as a result of fiat by the Chair or folly by the House. It was the express decision of the Government. I cannot, off the top of my head, remember for certain whether the Honourable Gentleman supported the Government's position on that matter. I have a very high regard for his ability because he's an extremely able man. I hope he won't take offence if I say, in the nicest possible way, that he has always seemed to me to be a keen supporter of close regulatory alignment with the Government Whip's office. Oh. Um, Yes, indeed. Mr. Mary Sherman. Mr. Speaker, can I uh, thank you for. Mr. Speaker, can I thank you for your guidance today? Here we are in the greatest constitutional co uh, uh, situation and uh, uh, very grave situation that I have seen in my nearly 40 years in this House. And if it wasn't for your good guidance today and over the, the, the last few weeks, I think this, this House would have been very badly served indeed. But the fact of the matter, Mr Speaker, is what you have said today has grave repercussions for the business of the House. And what is the advice from the Chair, or could we have an early statement from the Prime Minister or the Leader of the House, what is the next step? This, we're leaving the European Union. We have a few days. What is the best way that we can represent our constituents at this grave time of crisis? short answer is let's debate these matters sooner rather than later. Of course the Government, for the most part, controls the order paper. We know that, and the Right Honourable Lady, the Leader of the House, is the Government's representative in the House. But there are, of course, situations in which members can give voice to their views whether the Government particularly wants that to happen or not. For example, on over, I think, 570 occasions over the last nine and a half years, I have seen fit to grant urgent questions, believing that that is in the interests of the House, beneficial to backbenchers and securing ministerial presence in the chamber so that the Government can be legitimately questioned, probed, scrutinised, challenged and held to account. There will be further such opportunities today, and knowing the ingenuity of the Honourable Gentleman, who will have served 40 years in the House in less than two months' time, I feel certain that he will be well up to the task of posing suitable inquiries and expressing his views on this matter in the days ahead. A point of order, Mr Peter Bone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, you are absolutely correct at what Ursula May says. A motion or an amendment which is the same in substance as a question which has been decided during a session may not be brought forward again during the same session. I think that is absolutely clear. And I was, sir, wondering when you allowed the second meaningful vote. Uh, I, 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 obviously, you are ruling on it, but it was clearly a, a balanced decision on that occasion. But what this seems to be clear to me, sir, it is about the motion, uh, whether it's substantially changed or not. It's not about whether something else has happened. That's irrelevant. It's what has actually happened to the mo motion. And, of course, we do have the <coughs> procedure in this House, Mr Speaker, of the previous question. And it was, I was possibly thinking of doing that. The reason we have the previous question is so that the same question can continue to be debated another time. So would you confirm, that, it, sir, that it's about the substance of the motion, not something else happening outside? It is about the substance of the motion, what it is commending to the House, what proposition is being put. It is not a question purely of the words, but of the meaning, of the intention, of the purpose. Uh, yes, indeed. Po point of order, Mr Tom Bray. Oh, I I do beg the hon Right Honourable Gentleman's pardon. If I, if I may, I'll just come to the Mr. Speaker Wishart first, and then I'll come to the Right Honourable Gentleman. Mr. Speaker Wishart. Yeah, very grateful yeah, to yeah. you, Mr. Speaker. And I think what you've made today is a very important and dramatic statement. And already constituents of mine are getting in touch with me asking exactly what that means. And I think we've got to be actually clear with the country with what you've said. The government cannot bring back 
another meaningful vote if it's the same as substance as the last one. Now, the government's one and only intention is to achieve and secure that. This week, they were intending to do that very, very thing, and now you said that can't happen. So I think just to stress that clarity, Mr Speaker, I think would be abundantly helpful. But my experience of this government, and I don't know if it's yours, is they will try anything to, to get this through, the, and they will have the impertinence to try and bring this back once again through any sort of guise that they think is going to be possible, and maybe it will be the DUP agreeing with their deal. C could you say to us, Mr Speaker, how you intend to be vigilant to that prospect, and what criteria will be assessed if the government is going to bring back some sort of motion which they will try to present as being significantly different to their last motion, how do we judge and assess what they are doing so that this ruling can stand? Because it is an important ruling and it's a correct ruling. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a question of whether the proposition is the same or substantially the same. I would confer, I would of course seek advice, I would have my eyes and ears open, and I am looking to serve the House to reflect its interests and to demonstrate respect for its wishes. I simply repeat that the Convention is there for a purpose, and that purpose seems to me to be an honourable and valid purpose. I am afraid as to the particulars, I will have to look at them in the light of what is presented. But I would hope that the government would feel that respect for procedure does matter. And, you know, I, and I note that as the right honourable gentleman asks his question and I respond, the Leader of the House is playing with her electronic device and so is the Deputy Chief Whip. I didn't include him in the category of very senior people in the House, but that's a, a debatable proposition I readily grant. But it would seem to me to be helpful if people showed respect for each other in these circumstances, and if they were in the chamber, listened to what others had to say. But if they choose not to do so, well, so be it. I, I try to show good manners, and I hope others will try to do so as well. And uh, a point of order, Mr Robert Halfon. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I uh, understand your clarity on this. Just to confirm, given that the uh, vote for a second referendum was overwhelmingly rejected by the House of Commons last week, does this mean that if it is brought back, you apply the same considerations so that the motion will not be repeated? Earlier inquisitors that everything depends on the circumstance. Is the proposition fundamentally the same, or can it be argued in the circumstances of the time that it is a different proposition? And, you know, I would have to look at that. I would have to look at that in the circumstances of the time. But is it a relevant factor to be considered? Of course it is. That's why I have articulated the Convention in the way in which I have done. Uh, yes, in, yes, indeed. Point of order, Mr Tom Brake. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. First of all, Mr Speaker, I'm wondering if you are able to, to update the House on any sanctions that might have been applied since uh, 1604 to any governments that have sought to retable the same motion and what such sanctions might be available uh, to you today. And also, I wanted your, your reassurance, Mr Speaker, that uh, clearly we have, uh, over a number of months, tabled a, a succession of amendments in relation to a people's vote. And I just wanted clarity from you that there's nothing in terms of what you said that would preclude us pressing another uh, amendment on the matter of a people's vote. The honourable, right honourable gentleman who asked me, it depends on the context, it depends on the circumstances. I can't yet know in what situation a proposition might be put. When the Right Honourable Gentleman asks me about sanctions, I think what I would say to you is I'm not aware of any particular sanctions other than that if a proposition is judged to be the same or substantially the same, it doesn't find its way onto the order paper. There may be instances in which this has been dishonoured or inadvertently neglected, but I referenced in my statement the fact that the absence of Speaker intervention since 1920 is attributable not to the discontinuation of the Convention, but to general compliance with it. For the most part, the Convention has not been invoked in respect of governments, but I would argue that that is 
not least because, on the whole, governments have tended to comply with the Convention. Um, uh, point of order, James Cleverley. Speaker, I'm obliged. Um, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Do you, sir, uh, concede that had you made this statement in fundamentally the same way as you made today, between the first and the second presentation of a meaningful vote, there might be members in this House perhaps believing that the second meaningful vote was the last opportunity they might have to vote positively on this, could have indeed uh, changed their mind. And uh, might I... And might I... And might I... Uh, might I... Uh, and might I uh, also inquire, sir, might I also inquire that as uh, we have seen sometimes uh, uh, in particularly fast-moving negotiations that there may be changes, substantial if subtle, changes in the, uh, in the, uh, in the agreement during the stage of the debate and before the vote? And in that instance, how, sir, uh, would you assess that in terms of the validity of uh, another presentation of meaningful vote? The latter point of the honourable gentleman is nuanced. And I think that it would be sensible to say, I'm afraid, because it will disappoint him, but it has, happens to have the advantage of being true, that I would have to look at the particulars. I cannot possibly be expected to pontificate or even to speculate idly on an abstract proposition. I would have to look at the reality of what was on the table. But what I say to the Honourable Gentleman in respect of his first point, and I have always had a great fondness for the Honourable Gentleman, is that although the Speaker tries to be helpful to the House, it is not my responsibility, and I would not ordinarily be expected, to hold members' hands in advising them of how they should vote in a particular circumstance. Members are perfectly capable of making these judgments for themselves. And the reason why I didn't make a statement at an earlier stage, I say in terms which brook of misunderstanding, is that no such statement was required for the simple reason that I adduced in my statement that the second vote on March the 12th and the debate that preceded it were entirely proper. There was not a breach of the Convention. So for the Honourable Gentleman to say that it would have been helpful if I had said what I didn't say at a time that I could have said it, because it might have assisted members who, as a result of it not being said, weren't helped, is not altogether helpful. And I'm not sure that I would say that his logic is impeccable. I'm not sure that I would say his logic is impeccable. Uh, point of order, Mr Stephen Doughty. Uh, thank, you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your statement today. Um, the Government, Mr Speaker, has gained a infamous historical reputation for uh, trickery and abuse of Parliament during this whole process. Yeah. And there are rumours already going around that they might seek to use the uh, method of prorogation as a way of getting out of this. Now, not only would that provoke a greater constitutional crisis, but would you confirm, Mr Speaker, that it would also result in losing every single piece of legislation currently before both Houses, including many of the pieces of legislation needed to implement any Brexit? Carry over, that would not apply. But in the expectation, let us say, or simply, I will use a more neutral term, in the circumstance that particular legislation was not subject to the carryover procedure, manifestly and incontrovertibly, it would fall. Um, as to whether the government is contemplating that, I have no way of knowing. No minister has indicated that to me. Uh, I have no idea what is in their mind. It would be an unusual step, but look, I have been in this place now a little over 20 years and some quite unusual things have happened. I have no way of knowing uh, whether this is being contemplated. Uh, 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 point of order, Sir Robert Sims. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In 1604 and in uh, 1920, we were a sovereign parliament and we were not subject to the EU constitution, which this House voted for under the Lisbon Treaty. And this House has passed legislation under Article 50 in order for us to leave the European Union, which is time sensitive. Now, Parliament could go in a, a rather stately manner in 1920 because it wasn't subject to such things, but we actually, as a Parliament, have voted to leave on a particular date and therefore there is a certain uh, importance that decisions are made prior to that date and not in the next session. 
Secondly, yeah, but that's an act, the so. meaningful vote in itself is a constitutional innovation. It was this Parliament trying to impose on the government greater parliamentary scrutiny. Yeah, yeah. In that process, the government has brought forward votes, in fact, more votes than most of us expected, and with more amendments than most of us expected. And I think there was a degree of constitutional innovation, I think, in what uh, you ruled in, in that process, Mr. Speaker, in order to involve Parliament. I can see no reason if, um, because of the time uh, nature of the uh, proposition, and because this Parliament wanted to be involved, why we shouldn't be put through the pain of maybe another vote because of the time-sensitive nature of this particular proposal. And I would stress, Article 50 went through this House, the Withdrawal Act went through this House. Every member of this House expects to have a say on the type of Brexit that we actually are going to undertake. And even if the, we are dealing with an issue which has been dealt with before, it is sometimes important that this House makes a decision or decides not to make a decision, but not to consider the matter again, could in itself have consequences. Yeah. 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 One has to reflect on the particulars. What I would say to the right honourable gentleman is that the issue is not the pain of any vote, which is a subjective matter upon which I don't think I should pontificate, especially as I don't cast such, other than in the circumstances of a tie, which has not arisen, I think, since 1993 in this chamber. But it's propriety. The issue is not the pain of a vote, but its propriety. It is absolutely true that the House has legislated in respect of Article 50. I believe it did so in March 2017 in the last Parliament, and that has created a very strong expectation. That is entirely true. But whether Parliament chooses to legislate on this matter, or as the Government has signalled in recent days, depending upon circumstance, to request a particular extension is a matter for the House. I don't think that the issue of pain really comes into it. It's just a question of what is proper. And I know that the honourable gentleman, whom I've known since we competed with each other in Bristol South in June 1989, is a stickler for propriety. Um, well, I think it would be unseemly for me to say. Unseemly for me to say. I've asked who won. Well, it's not, it's not seemly for me to say. I think the Honourable Gentleman's result at the 1992 election was rather better than mine. Um, the point of order, Kate Hoey. Speaker, and obviously we fully endorse your, your statement and respect it. But could I just ask for a point of clarification, or would it be an order to ask, uh, but that I'm sure people out there will be asking when they read this today. Um, on January the 29th, the House of Commons voted against the SNP Plaid Cymru Amendment uh, by 327 votes to 39, which ruled out an extension of the Article 50 period and ruled out no deal. So... Uh, I mean, we obviously voted again on that last week. Could you just perhaps clarify why that wouldn't have fallen into the same ruling? I would have to look back at those particular votes. I didn't receive advice at that time about non-compliance, and I don't think there was a general sense in the House that there was an issue of non-compliance, and I wasn't asked to rule on it. Matters are already treated of by the table office on the basis of established custom and practice and if those matters were accepted onto the paper the issue of selection was an issue of selection for me in the interest of facilitating the debate but the issue of propriety was not raised with me at that time uh, 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 yes, indeed. A point of order, Sir Hugo Swire. Most grateful to you, Mr Speaker. Most people watching our deliberations watch them with the increased amazement, frankly. They don't understand the nuances of the twists and changes of the way we go about our business here. And to many of them, what we do at the moment makes very little sense at all. Yeah. They want to get on with things. So can I ask you, Mr Speaker, as the custodian uh, of the reputation of this House, whether you really think in bringing this ruling today at this stage rather than perhaps last week, because many of us are looking forward to trying to vote again one way or another this week, uh, and perhaps you could inform the House as to how you came to this opinion and when, whether it would have been better at the time of the second vote to have announced that this was not time to have a third vote. 
I agree. I well, I, uh, I'm a little taken aback by the inquiry from the right honourable gentleman. I think I signalled to the honourable gentleman, the member for Braintree, why I didn't think that any statement was required at that time. It is, of course, true that the House passed a motion on Thursday that specified a potential end date for an agreement to be reached. And it specified that if an agreement was reached by that date, a particular extension, I think if memory serves me, to the end of June to Article 50, would be requested of the Union. Why did I not say anything at that time? Uh, that was a motion passed, but it wasn't the motion in respect of the withdrawal agreement. And I could have had no way of knowing at that time whether revisions to the agreement or accompanying declaration would be sought, let alone obtained. So I can be expected to rule only at the material time. And if I had ruled, I hope the Right Honourable General will forgive me because I know he has a great sense of fair play. If I had ruled last week, I think I can say with complete confidence that there would have been people accusing me of being hasty and premature and commending to me the idea of waiting. And I thought that it was appropriate to reflect on the matter over a period of days. And what I'm saying, I'm saying before the government has tabled a new proposition. So it seems to me timely to say it now rather than to wait several days. But to have done so several days ago did not seem to me to be warranted. I have made my best judgment in the interests of the House as an institution and of its individual members. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. A point of order, Mrs. Helen Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you are obviously right that the House does not wish to vote on the same proposition over and over again. Equally, I'm sure you will be aware of the fact that some honourable members were interested in meaningful votes because they would be able to vote on amendments on matters which we have not yet considered as, uh, at that time. Uh, now, if the government is unable to make any changes to their proposition, uh, I'm seeking your guidance as to how we might secure opportunities for voting on those alternative propositions. I heard you talk about urgent questions, but of course there's no vote on an urgent question or a statement, and a standing order 24 is a motion in neutral terms. The government has not been very generous recently in offering opposition day debates either. So I'm, I'm just really seeking your advice on, on how honourable members might proceed. It would be helpful to the opposition if opposition days were supplied, and that hasn't happened recently, and I've no way of knowing whether the Leader of the House has it in mind to provide for opposition days. I think colleagues would think that it was a democratic and seemly thing to do to ensure that the principal opposition party had the requisite allocation of days. So far as other business is concerned, what I would say to the Honourable Lady is that she should look closely at the Standing Order No. 24 procedure. Uh, what she says about it is true, uh, but I think that uh, she should reflect upon the opportunities that the Standing Order No. 24 procedure presents, because the opportunities are fuller uh, than has traditionally been acknowledged or taken advantage of by members of the House of Commons. A uh, point of order, Mr John Whittingdale. Um, Mr Speaker, you helpfully reminded us at the beginning of your statement of the size of the majority against the, in the vote which took place last week. I think most observers would feel that in order for that to be turned around and for the motion to pass, it would require a significant change. And as I understand from your ruling this afternoon, if perhaps at the European Council in a few days' time a significant change could be achieved, then you would allow a further meaningful vote on that basis. The right honourable gentleman is very fair-minded, uh, and what's more, he's perceptive. I think I hinted at that, perhaps not with the crystal clarity that the right honourable gentleman has brought to bear on the subject, but in essence he's right. If there is a substantially different proposition put as a result of revisions sought and obtained and new agreement reached, 
that would constitute a new proposition to be put to the House. Uh, I would have to look at the particulars, and I'm not committing to a specific at this moment, uh, but I think nobody could outdo the right honourable gentleman today by way of reasonableness. Oh, well, a Kingston Knight, no less. Point of order, Sir Edward Davey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In our current constitutional crisis, can I welcome your reaffirmation of the rule of law in this House, namely Erskine May, and the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty? Given the gravity of the situation, though, could you enlighten the House as to whether Erskine May makes any provision for a Speaker's conference to bring together all parties in this House under your chairmanship, sir, to try to find a way forward? Well, uh, there can always be speakers' conferences, though uh, uh, I must say, and I don't direct this particularly at this government at all, it is a wider observation, it is a perhaps curious and quaint fact that ordinarily speakers' conferences are convened at the instigation of the government of the day. Indeed, I recall a particular occasion some years ago when I had some interest in the possibility of a speaker's conference on aspects of parliamentary power. If I say to the right honourable gentleman that the reaction at the time to my suggestion of the then Leader of the House was not wildly enthusiastic, I think I would be somewhat understating the position. But that was then, and maybe the new Leader of the House, or relatively new Leader of the House, who has been a notable reformer in other respects, will be seized by the salience of what the Right Honourable Gentleman has commended to the House, and will feel that she could have a key role in initiating such an important constitutional development. And if she did, you know, I would be perfectly willing to play ball with it. I have no idea. It's not something she and I have discussed. But you never know. You never know. Point of order, the, the Leader of the House. Yeah, Mr Speaker, I just want to uh, be very clear. I am indeed a reforming Leader of the House of Commons. And for me, treating colleagues with courtesy and respect is at the forefront of that reform. And any Speaker's Council would have to have that at its heart. And I simply would not be confident that that would be the case. Well, so be it. I treat the House with respect. I've treated its members with respect. I chaired a previous Speaker's Conference and there was no criticism of the way in which I did so. One reason why the Leader of the House might not be well versed in that particular Speaker's Conference and in a position to make a judgment about my chairmanship of it is very simply that it took place before the Right Honourable Lady entered the House of Commons. Point of order. Uh, point of order, Dr Matthew Offord. This House runs on conventions, as you have already made clear in your statement today. And one of those conventions is that the Treasury bench always tells the opposition bench of statements they are going to make. So to clarify this, Mr Speaker, can you confirm to the House that you not only informed the Leader of the House of your intention to make this statement, but also told her the contents of your statement? He can't confirm anything of the sort. And what I would say to the honourable gentleman is that his understanding about what might happen between the usual channels is one thing. That absolutely does not apply to speaker's statements. And if the honourable oh, well, the honourable gentleman shrugs and says, why not? That has never been the case. The Speaker of the House makes statements to the House at a time when the Speaker of the House thinks that they will be of interest and benefit to the House. I am under absolutely no obligation whatsoever to pre-announce that statement, either to the Leader of the House or to the Shadow of Leader of the House, and I did not do so. And if the Honourable Gentleman, a keen student of parliamentary procedure, is offended by that fact, well, I'm sorry, and he is, of course, welcome to be offended. But there is absolutely no breach of parliamentary protocol or etiquette whatsoever. That is the reality, and I have explained the position in terms clear and unmistakable. Point of order, Mr Grant Davis. 
Mr Speaker, can you confirm that a meaningful vote would be intrinsically different if it included the provision for a confirmatory vote by way of a public vote? Look at the particulars. I would look at the specifics, I would assess what was being proposed, and I would make a judgment about it. I prefer at this stage to rest on what I have already said about the principle that something should be different, not the same or substantially the same. I would have to look at the specifics and the circumstances of the time. Point of order, Carol Monaghan. Mr Speaker, we are now 11 days, 6 hours, 21 minutes and about 40 seconds from leaving. This can be described as nothing other than a constitutional here, here, crisis. Here, here, here. So can you advise, Mr Speaker, how we can bring forward a, an emergency motion on revoking Article 50? Well, emergency motions, and, and I say this as much for the benefit of people observing our proceedings as for members of the House, are capable of being requested understanding order number 24. The Honourable Lady will know that any member can apply for the right to conduct a standing order number 24 mo motion, can conduct a standing order number 24 debate on a motion and that request is in the first instance submitted to me if I decide that the application can be made in a speech of up to three minutes it is made on the floor of the House if I decide that the application is valid and the application is supported then the debate can take place and there's nothing to stop such debates taking place in the ensuing days. Many have taken place before, obviously on nothing like the scale of urgent questions, but many have taken place before and I have no reason to suppose that it will be different in the future. Uh, yes, point of order, Alex Burkhart. Thank you. Does this House have the authority to suspend the standing orders that prevent motions being brought back to the House in the same form again? The Clerk of the House confirms my own understanding, which is the House is the custodian of its own standing orders. The standing orders are a matter for the House, and those standing orders can be changed. Uh, that has happened before, and conceivably it could happen again. So, in terms of the central inquiry, the answer is yes. Uh, point of all order, Hal Williams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, is there any, any definition in terms of precedence of the meaning of the term substantial change. And if there is not, can you just confirm that that does not preclude you from uh, making a novel decision? I'm sorry if this disappoints the Honourable Gentleman, but it is context specific and it is a judgment for the Chair. And the Chair seeks to make a judgment on the basis of what is going to be in the interests of the House. I don't think I can say fairer than or different to that, and I hope that that is useful to colleagues. Uh, point of order, Mark Pritchard. I just wonder, for clarity, is it the case that you've not ruled out having a third meaningful vote? It is just a matter of that vote being conditional on other matters applying. In the motion, as well as in the substance? I think I explained the position to the Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Malden. It depends on the specific terms of what is proposed. And in answer to the Honourable Gentleman, forgive me, and I, I don't mean this discourteously in any way, I don't know whether he was here throughout our exchanges. Maybe he was. You know, maybe he was. I don't know. But what I was seeking to convey was that a new proposition could be put, but the Convention would militate against the same or substantially the same proposition being put. So I am not closing the door, and indeed I quite specifically said towards the end of my statement, this ruling should not be regarded as my last word on the subject. It is simply meant to indicate the test which the Government must meet in order for me to rule that a third meaningful vote can legitimately be held in this parliamentary session. I don't see that I can expand upon that, nor should I be required today to do so. To be, to be helpful, well, well, I think the Speaker decides, the speaker decides 
So would your advice be to those that perhaps are getting exercise about this, don't panic? <laughs> well, I'm always inclined to say don't panic. I'm not in the business of panicking myself. I think I can safely say I've never lost a wink of sleep over any work-related matter. There is no merit or purpose in doing so. I think we should approach these matters with calm, uh, deploy reason, and seek to make sensible judgments, not just in our own interests and in the interests of the House, but of the people that we are sent here to represent. I've always done that, and I'm sure that that is what colleagues think it is right to do, including most certainly the Honourable Gentleman. If there are no further points of order, I'm most grateful to colleagues for the interest that they've shown and the inquiries they've put, and I thank them for their involvement. We come now to the urgent...